The first is a testimony of Heavenly Father and His plan, Jesus Christ and His atonement, and the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these latter days. To do this, we must teach restored truth and bear testimony of those truths. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, a Chinese physician named Grace spent 18 months visiting medical institutions in Salt Lake City. She came to learn the medical aspects of heart transplantation. My family befriended her, and we included her in many activities. On Christmas Day, on a Christmas Day that actually fell on a Sunday, we invited her to church for a sacrament meeting. We were hoping the messages would teach of Jesus Christ and emphasize the reasons for the Christmas celebrations. I was serving as a state president at the time and sat on the stand during the meeting. My wife and daughter sat with Grace in the congregation. After the sacrament, the first speaker told a well-known but fictitious story of a fourth wise man. It was beautifully told and evoked sentimentality. The next speaker based his remarks on a story of three anthropomorphized trees. One tree wanted to be a beautiful chest, but instead became a feed box for animals, a manger into which a baby in Bethlehem was laid. The second wanted to become an admired sailing vessel. Instead, it became an unremarkable boat used by ordinary fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. During a raging storm, a man the others referred to as Master said, Peace, and the storm stilled. The third tree wanted to be fashioned into something that could be admired from afar. Instead, it became beams on which a man was crucified on a hill called Calvary. Again, another fictitious but sentimental Christmas story. I was disappointed in the content of the meeting, and I felt it, we couldn't let it end that way for grace. Even though we were out of time, I leaned over to the bishop, and I asked, Are you going to fix this meeting, or do you want me to? <laughs> he said he'd take care of it. He went to the pulpit, took five minutes, and explained who, explained who the babe in Bethlehem was and what he would accomplish. The bishop bore a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, as the Savior of mankind. He announced the closing hymn in prayer and sat down. As the closing hymn was being sung, Grace leaned over to my wife Ruth and said, Ruth, when that bishop spoke, something in the meeting changed. It had indeed. The speakers had been well-meaning, but had served up theological Twinkies, spiritually empty calories, anemic expressions of faith and testimony that were devoid of the power of the Word of God and consequently of the Spirit. The bishop's sincere testimony was founded on the truths taught in the Scriptures and the teachings of the Lord's prophets. That's what invited the Spirit into the meeting. I concluded that it's hard for the Spirit to bear witness to the truthfulness of a fictitious story. Whatever else we've done in our teaching, we need to always bring our teaching back to Jesus Christ and His atonement, Heavenly Father and His plan, and the restoration of His gospel. Of course it's fine to use stories, even fictitious ones, to grab the attention of students. I mean, I use Twinkies to get your attention. But once we have our students' attention, we need to deliver the nourishment that changes lives. I guess I should have followed up with the Twinkies and served up carrot sticks, broccoli, hummus. But I didn't. The Apostle Paul declared, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul then asked a series of questions that helps us understand the importance of an authorized teacher teaching this essential staple. He asked, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Paul then offered this conclusion. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In order for your students to develop faith in Jesus Christ and his central role in the Father's plan, teaching them about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ is paramount. The theme for this conference says it all. Seek this Jesus, of whom the prophets and apostles have written. The famous Scottish religious reformer and preacher, Thomas Chalmers, wrote about his experiences learning this principle. Chalmers lived from 1780 to 1847. Toward the end of his life, Chalmers realized that he had conducted an unplanned experiment during his preaching. For years, he had preached against all forms of immorality and defects in character. He focused on his parishioners' outward behavior, essentially teaching the Ten Commandments. The result was disappointing. He found that his words had all the weight of a feather on the moral habits of his parishioners. He realized that even if he convinced someone not to steal, the man's soul remained unchanged. The man was no different inside, even though the man refrained from bad behavior. Stated differently, you can change behavior without altering a student's heart. Then Chalmers began preaching reconciliation to God and the forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ. Not until he taught his parishioners in this way did they reform their lives. The great lesson he learned is that to preach Christ is the only effective way of preaching morality. He realized his earlier error, that he had worked to change behavior, not hearts. Now he worked to change hearts, and behavior naturally and concomitantly changed. Knowing that Jesus is the Christ, that he's my Savior and my Redeemer, has changed my life and my heart. This knowledge has changed my behavior in a way nothing else could. I know that I've been the beneficiary of his infinite atoning sacrifice. That is the knowledge that really changes lives.